Muchas gracias. Nos quedamos. Thank you. We have a few more minutes. And Esther Tamadu. Akimini, you have the floor. My name is Akimini Uwan. I'm a public theologian, a member of the International Civil Working Group for Permanent People, for the People Permanent Forum for People of African Descent, co-founder of Truth Table podcast, and the co-author of Truth Table: Black Women's Musings on Life, Love, and Liberation. I am a devout Christian woman. My faith is bound to the brown skin, Palestinian, Jewish, God man, the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith follows in the tradition of African and African American women, starting with my Bibio grandmother, Eric Ebeck Johnson, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Mariah W. Stewart, and Ida B. Wells Barnett. These women place their faith in the liberator, the Lord Jesus Christ, and live to liberate their own people in defiance of the ubiquitous counterfeit white supremacist Christianity of their day. This is the Christian tradition to which I belong, and it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that I declare that churches owe a debt. As a public theologian, it is my duty and calling to put forth a liberating framework where the dignity, livelihoods, and flourishing of all African people and people of African descent are upheld. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. What I am ashamed about, aghast at, and angered by, is the Catholic and Protestant churches' complicity in the oppression of my people. It is a lamentable fact, a lamentable fact, that the church, both Catholic and Protestant, were the architects of and the primary vehicles through which the transatlantic slave trade, chattel slavery, colonialism, and imperialism, among a host of other wicked enterprises, spread on and through the African continent and beyond. Therefore, I am calling the church to account on theological grounds for its egregious sins against Africans and African descended people. Ecclesial, theological, and hermeneutical malfeasance via the doctrine of discovery, the curse of Ham, and other wicked interpretations of the Bible laid the groundwork for African and African descended people's perpetual oppression. Reparations is personal for me. I am a black woman, an African American woman, a Nigerian American woman, an African woman, a Nigerian woman, an Ibibio woman. Therefore, I don't speak about slavery and reparations as an outside observer. According to Dr. Randy J. Sparks, 1.2 million enslaved Africans were transported from the Cross and Niger rivers in the 18th century. That's 10% of the 12.5 million Africans stolen during the transatlantic slave trade. My people, the Ibibio people, make up a significant portion of the 10% of Africans stolen and brought to the Americas. The church must be called to account for its reprehensible contribution to the constellation of oppression mentioned above, and I'm calling on the UN and my fellow reparationist comrades to include the Catholic and Protestant churches in the quest for global reparations to Africans and people of African descent. Failing to do so is a grave miscalculation. Churches owe a debt. Thank you, and I yield. Well, hello, and welcome to the Well After Hours. I'm again your host, Beverly Allen. Good to be with you again, because today we are going to be talking about 
a global subject. You know, there are a number of growing global voices calling for restitution and reparation for African slaves, descendants of the transatlantic slave trading who've mm -hmm. suffered kindness, criminal injustices and cruel treatment and behavior. And you know what the ravages of, ravages of it still exist to this day. But you know what? I am so pleased to be able to welcome back my returning guest, who is one of those powerful global voices to the well after hours. I want to welcome Ikemeni Uwan, who is a public theologian, an international human rights activist, minister of the gospel, which she is so passionate about. She is the co-host of Truth's Table podcast and Truth Table, Get in the Word with Truth Table. She mm -hmm. is also, lastly, but not least, <laughs> the co-author of Truth Table book on Truth Table, Black Women's Musings on Life, Love, and Liberation. I want to welcome, thank you for coming back to be with us, Ikemini. <laughs> you for having me sis beverly it's good to be back on here thank you for always inviting me and keeping up with my work <laughs> i can't help but keep up with your work it is absolutely amazing and you know um we're going to highlight some of your work things that you've done in the past and what you're doing right now what you're looking to do in the future later on in the show for the viewers but you know what you are one of those voices on the global platform for reparations. And we just really needed to have it here. And I want to start off first by saying that there is a um, the scripture by uh, Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, when he's confronted <laughs> by Jesus, he wanted to see him. And he was a very wealthy man. And he says to the Lord, he said, if he had, he said, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I've restored it fourfold. Mm -hmm. To me, that kind of sounds like restoration and reparations of someone who has really been convicted of their heart on what is just and what is righteous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking in Kemeny of so many voices who were on the global stage that are talking, I was just uh, reading about the president of Guyana who demands slavery reparations ahead of a, of a apology from the plantation owner's descendants. And that president is Mohammed Arfan Ali. And he's calling for reparations. And him, not even he alone, but the, also the um, African um, Caribbean nations have joined for, forces to call for reparations for slavery too. I mean, finally, it has gotten to really a, uh, a larger platform where it is now seriously be, being spoken about. And you have been to the UN in Geneva. You've been there several times to be a global voice. And we're going to share that with you viewers a little later. But I, you know, thinking of that, I, I want to ask you, you are a minister of the gospel. You're a public theologian. Why is it so important that we try to deal with this theologically and biblically. Well, yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show and just for your really gracious, you know, introduction um, and invitation. Uh, yeah. I, I, well, uh, reparations is a biblical category. You know, so this is not, I know it has been uh, left in, you know, um, or, or I guess you could say, and I think in some ways the church has abdicated you know, to some degree, this biblical category over to politics and to the government and to, you know, all other different sectors. Um, and there's a place for that, for sure. <laughs> there's a place for that, absolutely. Uh, because unfortunately, there was a lot of, um, you know, blood on the hands of many institutions and um, wicked actors you know, in our own and our people's oppression, for sure. But it is a biblical category. You know, you lift it up, you know, Zacchaeus um, from Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, who was a chief tax collector. And tax collectors in that context were people that did defraud people. Uh, they were the ones that were taking advantage of the poor, um, the least um, and uh, the left out, you know, um, and, and, and making their living. 
uh, off of off of the backs of those who are um, oppressed, right? And 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 doing that in service to uh, empire. And in and if that sounds very familiar, right? Mm. <laughs> our capitalistic, you know, um, context, you know, where 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 even now with student loan debt, take that for example, which I'll always lift up. Um, because I I think that there's some very um, uh, nefarious practices, you know, um, there in the ways that in the interest rates, you know, had. Um, been uh, doled out, you know, to students who were promised that, you know, if you go to school, you'll make a certain amount of money and you'll be able to have, a, you know, a good secure future, and, you know, climb up, you know, the ladder and all that. But, you know, more and more, it's feeling like more like a bait and switch these days. So, mm. but um, nevertheless, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, but I, I, let me digress from that. But really the point is that reparations, that is biblical. You know, we are people that are um, our faith in uh, in Jesus Christ is contingent um, upon the grace given to us in order to confess our sins, to confer- confess first that we are sinners uh, and that we sin against God and we sin against ourselves and we sin against our neighbors, you know, um, and then confessing that sin, but also repenting, turning, right, changing our mind, you know, about the sin that we've committed. And then we make repair. We got to go get it right with the person that we've harmed. We got to um, uh, make reparate, repair, reparations, <laughs> you know, um, in, in, when when necessary, when we have actually done harm, you know, to our neighbor. And uh, and so the the example, you know, Zacchaeus, you know, in the text is, you know, is wonderful, you know, because he says, I will pay back four times the amount, you know, and it just talks about how the graciousness that's involved in the generosity and the abundant mindset that ought to come along with reparations. You know, it's just like when, you know, when you're you're punishing or or, or scolding or correcting a child, right? And says, you know, they've been fighting over, you know, they've been fighting and fighting and fighting, you know, over a toy or over something, you know, and you say, please give this toy back to Susie. You know, Susie had the toy, you know, first and having, you know, having, having to give it back, you know, then fighting and doing all this. And the person just throws the toy, right? You know, the other kid just throws the toy, you know, at Susie, not happy, not, no, no contrition, no remorse. No, you know what? I was wrong, you know, for taking the toy. They just simply give it over, you know, here. Right. You know, but that's not sufficient, you know, with regard to reparations. There was some harm. You hit me in the process of taking this toy. You called me names in the process of of, of taking this toy that was not yours. You know, you held on to this toy for however, however long you weren't supposed to have the toy anyway. You know, there needs to be an actual, you know, repair um, for uh, the the duration of time that the, the toy was taken, the harm incurred by Susie when she didn't have the toy and when she was asking for the toy back, you know, and so we have to all of that has to go into the into the pot, you know, when it comes to or, or into um yeah it just into consideration when we're talking about reparation and it has to be um, as far as we can on this side um, a comprehensive repair. You know, um, so not just a check, which I talked about, you know, in my speech in the UN, not just a check, but a check plus, right? So a check plus mental health services for the intergenerational mm. trauma that we've experienced. Hello, you know, a check uh, plus, sure, sure, a plus a, a debt cancellation, mm. <laughs> you know, for the debts incurred because of the uh, the, the uh, 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 racial wealth gap, the black mm. white. Wealth gap. OK, you know, like it is a check plus, 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 you know, and I I, I think that we just need a better, um, more comprehensive understanding of that. And I think far too uh, there's there's far too much of a scarcity mentality um, that comes up when we start talking about reparations. That is definitely true, because um, and I think that those who are not fighting against it are fighting against it because of how not just the racial disparities, but the narratives have been formed to keep them ignorant (laughs) 
as well as everybody else. They did the history. I mean, it, it really shows now why they don't want true history in our schools, in our classrooms. They don't want our children to know the truth. Mm -hmm. They didn't even tell us a little bit that, that they taught us in school about slavery was a, maybe a chapter, <laughs> a half a chapter, a little bit about it. They didn't talk about yeah. it. And I see why not. Because if you have to pull out the whole truth and narrative, if if it was traumatic for they, now they're saying, they. why should their children be traumatized? Well, wait a minute. Our children are still traumatized by living it. with the trauma, right? Every day. Yeah, living and, with it. Mm -hmm. And so that's an admission, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. but they tell us to get over it. <laughs> well, yeah, because if you admit, then you have to actually repair. You know, you got to do the harm, which is why, the, that's why this country is obsessed with myths and myth making. <laughs> and not facing the reality of the harm, uh, which is why we have not yet seen, um, you know, a, a full, let me say a, a full um, throttle, you know, approach to it. And yes, reparations is actually happening on local, you know, um, levels as well. So that that is happening and, and going forth, which is great. But we still need um, HR 40. We still need the federal and we need the global. We need the global movement because, quite frankly, I take a pan-African approach to um, reparations because it's uh, it is Africans and African descendants who have been harmed, um, particularly West Africans, but Africans that have been harmed uh, by the transatlantic slave trade and chattel slavery, um, and then also colonialism as well, right? And neo-colonialism, all of that has got to be accounted for. Um, and so we need a, a very serious global um, push. There is a global mandate for this uh, that has got to be rectified, you know. And so we need it to not just be happening locally, which is good. Um, it, it, it provides a good, you know, little precedence, uh, you know, to go forward, to keep on pushing the case. But we need it at the federal level. But we also need this um, to be on a global scale as well, you know, uh, with the UK, you know, all, France, you know, and, and the U.S., both, you know, um, working in St Spain, you know, Portugal. All, I mean, all of the actors, <laughs> mm. you know, the actors that co that created, you know, uh, and, and, and profited um, and engineered, uh, you know, the transatlantic slave trade and uh, chattel slavery, have got to, and, and colonialism, have got to absolutely come to the table and pay reparations. And that would also include the church, the Catholic church as well. You know, that's, that was one of my questions I wanted to ask you because you called out the Catholic church and the Protestant church uh, mm -hmm. involvement in that. Could you talk to the keepers a little bit about that? Yeah, so, involvement? yes, yes. Yeah. So the thing about it is that people... Um, often don't, I don't, are not always privy to, or I don't know, sometimes forget because, you know, because, well, because we don't really learn the history. Um, so, <laughs> to your point that, you know, that you already raised here, uh, people don't often know the history, right? They don't, they don't, you don't know what you don't know, you know? So I don't fault, I don't fault people um, for not knowing that. Uh, how, how would you know that? Uh, unless you actually do some digging yourself or if you learn or yeah, especially if you're not in those circles or I don't know, you just don't think in those in those ways, you wouldn't know um, that it was actually um, the doctrine of discovery, you know, where the, the Catholic and the Protestant, particularly the Catholic church, um, you know, really um, orchestrated, you know, it, it orchestrated the transit land. Or, or I should say sanction, let me say it that way, sanction, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the ownership and sale of other human beings, you know. So the doctrine of d discovery is like a set of like, it's like legal principles that govern um, the European colonial powers, um, especially with regard to indigenous lands. Um, and it, it really allowed them and, and, and gave them the theological uh, grounding. Uh, and let me say a warped, theological uh, a ground uh, for uh, settler colonialism, you know, where they go in and literally invade the land of indigenous people um, and commit all manner of violence against them in order to uproot them. If they found the land, it's theirs. And 
and the people, the indigenous people that were there, you know, are non-entities, you know, in their mind, right? Instead of the image bearers whom God mm. has created, whom God formed, whom God loves, <laughs> you know, um, and so that's um that's really important for people uh, uh to know. Uh, and then there were uh, also like papal bull, papal bulls, uh, which were official decrees that the Pope, um, uh, you know, disseminated uh, so that so that um, and the way well, really, what it is a papal bull is where there was a f- official decree um, where the Pope um, could use the full weight, you know, of his office, right, um, mm-hmm. of, his, of his office, um, and. Uh, you know, to actually sanction, you know, plunder um, and uh, dispossession, you know, of people, of human beings, you know. Um, so the papal bull, um, which is referred to as dum diversus, um, was one that was absolutely used in order to sanction um, uh, slavery, you know, and dispossession of land and colonialism. And so, and it held uh, that, and it granted permission you know, to, at that time, King Alfonso V of Portugal, he was allowed to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue pagans, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or Saracens, which at the time is what they called Muslims. So Muslims, right, at that time, and pagans, right? So a pagan was whoever was not Christian, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and and they were considered enemies of Christ, you know, and so they would place all of their kingdoms, all of their history, right? Their, their kingdoms, their, their culture, um, all of that uh, was subject to possession <laughs> by, you know, by the king or by the conqueror, you know, in this case, which was sanctioned by the Pope. Um, and so they could, they could literally in the dumb, in, in dumb diverses, it was stated that they could subject and reduce these people to perpetual slavery, right? And so that is what um, aided and sanctioned and undergirded the transatlantic slave trade, colo- settler colonialism, all manner, you know, of evil. That was the Catholic Church, you know, and so that sanctioned that. Um, and and gave the theological warped, you know, evil theological ground for that to happen, simply because the Pope's office <laughs> was conferred, you know, on via those pa- the papal bulls, particularly the dumb diverses. So yeah, there's it's it's serious. There's a there's real you know uh, a real um, theological malfeasance, which is what I cite, you know, in my my speech in the UN. Yes. Um, and the viewers are going to get to hear that shortly. You know, um, we think about apartheid that happened, you know, in our, in Africa, and and the apologies that were so given, supposedly open, finally uh, voicing and listening um, to the family members. They never talk while they could apologize and talk about the atrocities they committed, but. What did that after that? What did that lead to them? Did they did they get reparations? There were no real reparations given to those people. So what good is an apology? <laughs> well, we need a we need a, we need an apology. No, you do. No, that's I, the, that's, like, that's the confession part. So that fulfills the oh, you know, like a whole. We do need a we do need an apology because there is a symbolic you know element to reparations. You know, so you do need the apology because they have there has to be an, an admission of wrong. Do it. We have the yes. evidence. We have the evidence. We're living with the evidence now. Yeah. <laughs> the evidence abounds. Okay, but we do need the apology. That that does matter because that 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 is a significant part of the reparations. Is which is why we haven't really gotten the apology. <laughs> because if they apologize, then the not the the next co- logical conclusion is that that's you an admission. That's right. Repair. Do you got that's an admission. You have to actually reparate. <laughs> then you know which is why we have not gotten. You know, like a, a real clear, let me say it that way, mm-hmm. you know, um, very clear um, um, ownership and uh, apology where the ownership and onus, you know, of the transatlantic slave trade, the brutality of that um, wicked enterprise and chattel slavery has not really come to us. But we need that because it, it is an important step, right? So because it, it's it, that's that's also the fall kind of in the symbolic realm of of um 
of reparations, right? And before we can get to the material um, reparations, the, the the money, right? And the land or, you know, um, uh, loan, you know, loan forgiveness, debt, you know, um, however that those things, you know, we, you know those material um, forms of reparations, we got to get, we do need, you need the apology too. Need the apology. <laughs> you can't skip that. It's really, it is important. But yes, but I hear you. Yeah, it's been lip service, right? Right. Um, when it doesn't, when it doesn't follow with actions, it, it's insincere. Yeah. It's incomplete and insincere. Absolutely. And, and 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 that was kind of like to my point. So they did that, and then what? You know what I mean? And I think it's the kind of thing they want to follow all the way through globally. Like, okay, just just say you're sorry and and let's move on, you know, but, uh, but you can't move on, you know, yeah. it's possible. You know, I'm thinking about um, one of the talks that I heard Martin Luther, Dr. King give uh, from 1968, that now is all over uh, the mm -hmm. place kind of our, we always hear, I have a dream. I understand why they would rather play that than play what he said, because in, um, when he spoke to poor African people in Mississippi, this is in 1968, where he outlined the injustices that Africans faced at the hands of U.S. government and his plan to organize poor Africans to march on Washington to make the demand for reparations, he stated. He said, at the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, but they built land grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. And not mm -hmm. only that they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. And not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. And not only that, today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidi subsidies not to farm. Yes, yes, yes. And I thought about how you recently uh, were on Capitol Hill with some advocating for um, Puerto Rico uh, farmers. Yes, Can yes. you talk about that a bit? Well, the yeah, I was advocating for them, uh, for black farmers um, too, you know, because we know yes. that, you know, African-Americans were promised, you know, um, a form 40 of acres. <laughs> 40 acres and a mule, you know, but we know that promise, you know, to them was, it, it was given to them, you know, to whiten slavers and for generations, black farmers, They've been subject to racial discrimination. Um, you know that. Um, mm -hmm. and disenfranchisement, denial of loans, and um, and on the rare occasion that their loan uh, is approved, they're subject to a slow processing delays that make it impossible to plant their crop in the appointed time. Because, you know, with farming, there is an appointed yes, time yes. To, plant to plant your crop. If you do not plant it, you miss that, that mm -hmm. window. And you don't have you know, uh, a harvest, you know, you, do, you, you don't have anything and that's your, your livelihood and that's your living. And so anyway, so um, I um, went to Capitol Hill earlier this, uh, well, I guess we're not in summer anymore, but <laughs> summer. <laughs> goodbye summer 2023. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, I went there uh, and met with uh, Congressman um, uh, uh, Hakeem uh, Jeffries <laughs> and uh, with our Pan-African um, dele delegation to advocate, you know, for Black farmers um, to get some equitable, equitable, you know, so financial support so that they um, can, too, can flourish and to thrive, you know, because over a century ago, Black farmers made up 14% of the population of U.S. farmers. But now they account for less than 2%, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It is, it is appalling. You know how few black farmers there are in the industry, and so I went there to do that. But on top of that, I did also um, um, advocate uh, for our Puerto Rican um, uh, siblings. You know, um, because they uh, are not. You know, because you know uh, they are not a part of the continental U.S., which is a whole another story, right? Um, they uh, are. They don't get 
so there's SNAP and then there's NAP. SNAP is um, Supplemental Assistance Nutrition Program and NAP is Nutrition Assistance Program. The S is dropped. The supplemental part is dropped. And honestly, NAP is just a, um, how can I say? It is a very significantly uh, uh, um, lower and reduced uh, form or shadow of what SNAP is, okay? Um, and SNAP being much more generous, you know, in the offerings that they get. And so, for instance, Puerto Ricans receive $116 to compare to what $307 less in federal assistance than Americans living in the continental U.S. And so, the, and they are citizens of the U.S. Mm. And they still get equal access to SNAP just like Americans in the continental U.S. do. So that's what we, I, I was there um, to also advocate for that because that all of those provisions would be, um, well, it would, 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 help, would help to kind of move the ball on those things under the, um, the farm bill. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have to see what happens with the government shut down and what might come of that because, you know, that will derail all types of things. You know, their government is, Every day, you know, it's, it's just a, a new, you know, we don't know what we're going to wake up to, you know, these days. There's a lot of, you know, political instability. So in that way, but yeah, so we have been, um, we were advocating, you know, um, for, for that. So um, the Puerto Rican Nutrition Act, Assistance Fairness Act, you know, to close mm -hmm. the gap act, that's really important. And then also uh, the Puerto Rican Nutrition Assistance Fairness Act, which is the companion bill. For closing the meal gap act, so we are we were that's that's what I was doing, you know, early um, in early summer of um, 2023. It's been quite a year, <laughs> a wow. lot of advocacy, a lot of advocacy. I'm telling you, uh, and you know, while people <laughs> they 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 may see you, you know, on the platform or you know, or posts or you know, uh, other interviews about you doing things. I think about um, how it may seem it looks exciting and to some people it looks glamorous, but you know what? It's also sacrificial. Okay. Behind that is a great sacrifice that people don't realize <laughs> that yeah. comes along with it. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, it's absolutely sacrificial. It is not easy. Um, there, there was a post and it's just true. People don't know the price of the oil. Yep. You know, I mean, when we say yes to God, people don't know the crushing. Mm -hmm. They don't know, the, mm -hmm. you know, they don't know the, 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 the tears, you know, you, you, you weep. You, they don't know the lonely road that you, you, you trod. People don't know that they, they only see the highlights. And I'm like, even the highlights, <laughs> you don't know. You don't know what was behind the scenes before that picture was taken. Like, seriously, you just don't know what people are grappling with, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not been a, it's not been an easy role. I love my life. I'm grateful for my ministry and what God's coming to do for sure. Grateful to be operating, you know, in my purpose and doing what God mm -hmm. has called me to do, but whew, it's been, um, it's, it's, it, it, listen, nobody knows the trouble. Only the Lord knows the trouble I've seen. Let's see it, you know, and the cost, there's a really great cost, you know, um, to following the, following the Lord in this way, um, particularly in a public way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Especially as a woman. Oh yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a cost. as a woman and a woman of color. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, but, um, you know, God gives us the grace. He calls certain people to do certain things <laughs> yeah, you know, and graces them to do it, even though they yet still feel the struggle. And that's why, you know, I, I personally even thank you for what you do and what you continue to do to be a voice because I, I empathize. And yet I realize why the Lord selected you and equipped you to do it. That's just his, you know, they say favor ain't fair, but you know, everybody wants favor, but they don't know there's a cost behind it too. <laughs> you know, so you don't want to be selected to do things, but I thank you for that. And you know what? We're gonna do this. Don't go away. We're gonna just take a, a minute of a break to uh share with you all uh some of I couldn't share it all to take up the whole show. <laughs> uh some of the things that uh Ikemini has done and what she is doing past and present uh, and catch you up to speed on that. And we'll be right back. So don't go away.
Kemini Uwen. I'm a public theologian, NAACP Image Award nominated author, co-founder and co-host of Truth Table Podcast, and a charter member of the International Civil Society Working Group for the UN Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. Mbubedewu ke America, edo into ete eyen. Translated in English, this simple yet profound Ibibio phrase means black people in America are our cousins. My parents would often repeat this Pan-African phrase because in it lies the oral history of the Ibibo connection to the transatlantic slave trade and chattel slavery. As early as I can remember, I have wrestled with the intrusive triad of questions. Who are my people? Where are my people? And to whom do I belong? When we talk about rep reparations, what are we repairing? Is it not the theft of over 12 million African people? Colonialism, the dislocation and disconnection between Africans and Africans in the diaspora, wrought by the wicked transatlantic slave trade, inter alia? Reparations is not merely about a check. It's a check plus land, plus debt cancellation, plus repatriation, plus reunification of continental Africans with African descendants in the diaspora. The foremost harms of the transatlantic slave trade were spiritual, which manifested economically, sociology, and sociologically, and psychologically. According to Ada Uro, author of Who Are the Abibio? Spiritual manipulation of African traditional religion was one of the primary ways the Abibio and Igbo people were captured and transported on ships called Delight and Shepherd, where enslaved Africans encountered another spiritual manipulation through counterfeit Christianity that married conversion with bondage over against the liberating and anti-imperialistic gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I recommend that PFAD follows up and requires tangible outcomes from Pope Francis, Francis and the Vatican based on Madam President Epsi Campbell Barr's letter to Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. I recommend the full adoption and implementation of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action because it is the basis for international organizing as it relates to people of African descent. Lastly, I recommend adequate funding for PFAD so that it can live up to its mandate and also develop a global reparations repository where the harms of enslavement's legacy and its oppressors can be accounted for. That would include the Vatican, the Protestant church, that would include insurance companies, that would include universities. Everybody's hands who's bloodied needs to be included in there and the survivors <laughs> ought to be remedied through that global repository. Um, and its attendant reparation can be built into the framework of a comprehensive global reparations plan. Thank you, and I yield. Thank you very much. Hi, we're back. I know you enjoyed seeing all of the things, some of the things, not all of the things, but many of the things that uh, Ikemeni Yuan has done uh, over the past, what she's doing in the present. And you can only believe she's going to be doing more in the future. And uh, Ikemeni, you know, one of the things I wanted to uh, talk about as we close down, because it is about racism and systemic mm -hmm. racism, slavery, it all comes out of that, is that do you think, I don't think we really talk enough. We talk about holiness and righteousness, of which I think even this is a, should be a part of. It's addressed and included in that is how we treat people, uh, or whether it's righteous or unrighteous or holy or unholy. How can you say that, you know, you love him whom you've never seen and hate him who you see every day? <laughs> Jesus asked the question that we don't maybe preach or teach or talk about 
uh, racism as a sin as mm -hmm. much as it should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I do think that depends on uh, which church we're talking about. <laughs> I think it does. I mean, I, I, the black church, absolutely. It does talk about racism, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, I think, but there are, I think there are some even within the black church. I think there are some black middle class churches that probably don't really touch it because, well, you know, uh, black folks, we live it, you know, every every day. We we're very well acquainted with it. We understand it. We know it. We know it better than white people because we have had to live under the thumb, you know, of racism and systemic racism and. Um, in structural racism. So we know it because we live it. And so, and there's a way in which on Sundays we want to escape that. And so I understand why, you know, there are some say like, I would say middle-class, you know, suburban black churches that don't even touch it at all. I understand. Mm -hmm. And because it's an escape because we know it. Right. And so in some ways you're kind of preaching, you know, to the choir. I do think we would stand to talk about internalized racism in a way, in its manifestations. One of the ways that it manifests itself is through colorism, you know, discrimination within within the group, within the racial group, um, against people that are darker skin, right? Mm -hmm. Favoring people that are of lighter skin for different, you know, for positions, jobs, marriage markets, they experience much better experience, you know, here and within our community. So I think that's a conversation that we ought to be having with that, with that we don't talk about, you know, enough. And you don't hear that in the church. Uh, all right around. And it goes on, right? Um, but yeah, but black churches do call out racism by and large, but again, the, also the demographics of the black church are changing as well. So we have to account for black immigrant churches, so African churches and Caribbean churches as well, um, which need serious political education on uh, racism and systemic racism um, and how they fit into um, this whole matrix of white supremacy. <laughs> um, I think that's very necessary. So I think sometimes we uh, we can be caught unawares by the changing demographics of the black church. With all that said, still, yet and still, even with those um, black immigrant churches, church communities, uh, they, even if they don't know intellectually, maybe, you know, they know experiential, experientially. And even if they're not able to connect the same dots, you know, with the same aptitude as um, our yeah, African American um, siblings, uh, you know, there's a knowing, you know, of racism. There's a knowing of discrimination. There's a a, a sense in which you know I'm not being treated the same way, <laughs> you know, as my non-black counterparts. I'm not. I'm, I'm getting a raw deal, you know, on my loans. I'm getting a raw deal, you know, when I keep getting all these rejections on my jobs. You know, they're looking at my name. Mm. And then, name, you know, they're, they're, I mean, they're not. They're passing up my, my resume. Keeps hitting the bottom of the pile. There's a knowing you know, there. But then I would also say um, when it comes to say white church though, <laughs> now they often are not talking about racism. No, exactly. They're not talking about racism. Mm -hmm. And that is an affront, you know, to God. It is um, a sin against God. Racism is, and white supremacy is a sin against the thrice holy God who has created every single human being in the image of God and said, it is good. You are good, Right. Um, in your constitution, in the way God has created you. I'm not saying that we're without sin. We, we are sinners. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and, and we do need to confess our sin and repent and come to faith in Jesus. So I'm not, I'm not ascribing some level of perfection you know, to human beings, but we are all image bearers. We bear the image of God um, within our soul and within our being, you know, within mm -hmm. our makeup, our physical makeup, um, our, our ontology. And so that... Uh, and anthropology. We have to um, condemn slavery, uh, 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 yes, slavery, uh, but racism, you know, and call it out for what it is. And a lot of the reasons why um, uh, some of those churches don't do that is because they don't want to reckon with their own racism. Um, and honestly, racism pays big bucks, you know. There's people connected to all types of institutions that are carrying out all manner of wickedness, and they are on the payroll. You know, uh, I think part of the cost of what my calling is, is that profits don't belong on the payroll. OK, mm -hmm. so profits ain't getting paid <laughs> to call out racism and white supremacy. That's not a that's not a lucrative mm -hmm. <laughs> surprise. Typically, you know what I mean? Uh, there's a reason yeah. why Jeremiah was weeping. Uh, that's why he was a weeping prophet. There's a reason why, you know, prophets didn't want to really they didn't want a prophetic calling. That's a hard that's a hard calling. Uh, that's a hard life. Typically, you know, it's a life of rejection. <laughs> It's a life of uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, 
destitution, you know, mm. uh, all types of uh, life of depression. I mean, it, it's, it's not, a it's not exactly the, it's not, it's, it's, it's not the, uh, it's not a fun calling. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's a hard calling. You know, it's, it's a hard calling. So you you, if you read when you read the prophets, you see exactly if you really understand, you know what they were going through. You can get a sense of like, whoo, I understand. I, I, I can I get a glimpse, you know, a, a taste, you know, for why, mm. you know, uh, there was they were so depressed and why, you know, there was so much weeping and why lamentation lamentations exist, right? That why that book exists, okay? Mm. You know, so. Um, yeah, so there, there's there's money to be made from racism, you know, from white racial capitalism. You know, um, that is what the foundation of this country. That is how it is built and established. That the the wealth of this country was built on the back of our ancestors and our rel- our relatives. That is what keeps the engine of America going, mm-hmm. and that's just the facts. Uh, and I'll ask you this because I know because of the kind of the platforms that you have been afforded and graced. Do you think that now with the, uh, I guess, the more vocal, some of the more vocal um, white Christian leaders or scholarship um, that have, uh, I guess, have also taken up the cause of racism? Um, and calling out in a way, I guess, that's hopefully palatable to people because mm-hmm. it's, it's such a hard subject to deal with for, you know, for others, especially, you know, the the actually white Caucasian or white, you know, evangelicals and churches, uh, many of them, um, to discuss that mm-hmm. it has become a little bit more um, embracing or at least a willingness to now look at reparations or to understand what it is, given some of the more historical uh, references that they didn't have before, to know that some of the things that they were learning in their universities was wrong. <laughs> it was right. kept from them, you know. Uh, and now to find truth, because it's the truth, you know, and scripture says, oh, it's the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You'll never be free if you don't know the truth and accept the truth. Do you think we're getting, making steps towards that? Does it look like? No, no. It's right it's a Christian counterparts. Hmm? I think it's a mixed bag. I think that there was this, I don't know, there, there is more openness, I think, to reparations. There are people that are much more open to it now. Um, that that are outside of our racial group of you know black people that are much more open to it. They understand it. They support you know reparations a little bit more, but we don't have the full cell you know. Um, uh, I would say um, support that that's needed quite yet. Um, and I do think that there was a time, um, unfortunately, after uh, George Floyd's lynching, uh, that people were you know in 2020 when people were. Buying up all of the anti-racism book and buying up everything by black authors, right? There was that small window when people were doing that, but um, since then there has been a recalcitrance, you know, um, to it. There's been um, that people have been hardened now. Um, white people have been hardened in their resistance to racism, in, in hearing about racism or anything having to do with racism. So there, there was that moment, you know. Um, you know, that flash in the pan, but it was quite literally a flash in the pan. Um, and since then, there's been much more of a hard heartedness to it. And then the, that lays, that legislation, um, you know, it's legislating book bans and all types of things is only concretizing, you know, that recalcitrance. So, yeah, I mean, I think yes and no, you know, the polls show that, you know, that there's more openness and support for reparations. And yet we're still not, we don't still have that watershed support, support you know, um, to quite get us, you know, the the federal and the global mm-hmm. you know, push. But we got to keep on pushing, you know. Um, I think mm-hmm. that eventually, uh, God willing, it will happen, you know. Um, and it is happening on the local level. I do want to keep on saying and regional. I, I do want to keep saying that. That's important to note. Um, but but ultimately we got to get that the global and the um, uh, the federal you know on board um, and 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 God willing that would happen in our 
lifetime. You know, people, we who believe in justice, you know, um, uh, to borrow the words of, I believe, of Ella Baker, you know, um, you know, we we cannot rest, right? But but I, I do think that we have to, we who believe in justice, know that the things that we advocate for and we work for, we may not see in our lifetime. And when you're a justice mm-hmm. worker, you know, you can't be selfish and want it just for you and yours. You got to mm-hmm. build a future for the generation behind you, for those that are coming after you. You know, that's very important, you know, um, mindset and posture to carry in to the justice work because it's about the collective good. It's about loving my neighbor as I love myself, but first and foremost, loving God, you know, uh, with my soul, uh, my uh, mind, soul, and um, all my mind, my soul, and my strength, you know, um, at least for me as a Christian that does this work. So, so yeah, I, I, think it, I think it can happen in our lifetime. Will it? I'm not sure. I, you know, again, I don't know. You know, we did have a black president. I didn't think that was going to happen in my lifetime and that happened. You know, uh, happened twice. You know, so and now we have a, 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 a vice president Kamala Harris, a black woman vice president. Again, that was never on my bingo card. I did not think that would happen either. And now look, so you never, you really don't know. You know, uh, miracles happen all the time, <laughs> and it will take a miracle, but it it it, it can happen. God yes. is working. Yes. Business. <laughs> God is still in the miracle business, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I tell you, this has just been uh, enlightening and informative, and it's always a blessing every time you come to the well. And that's why I am so grateful uh, when you carve out some time to be with us. And I just want to give you an opportunity before we kind of wind down or close out. uh, If there's any last remarks or comments that you would like to make um, about, you know, what you're doing. Um, and we're going to put up the information for people to contact you, to support you. Uh, as I said, because of the podcast that you have, this award-winning podcast, Truth Table, mm-hmm. and, you know, all that you do, even in in your scriptural teachings, you know, Bible teachings through tr- Truth Table. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, my I mean, honestly, when it comes, you know, to reparations, I think I'm always very passionate about um having a pan-African, well, I am a pan-African, but having a pan-African um uh, uh approach, you know, to reparations. You know, pan-African uh, um, pan-Africanism is the belief that people of African descent have common interests and and ought to be unified, you know, um, and we have to in in order to beat back um, the white supremacist order and the oppression that we all experience, whether we're continental Africans, whether we're descendants of Africans, whether we are within the African diaspora, in the US, South America, uh, uh, in Europe, wherever we find ourselves, um, uh, we are at bottom, we are Africans and we have a united, uh, and we ought to be united as such. And so, um, I think that's always a uh, that's always something I'm trying to lift up, you know, in my approach with reparations, and that is it's it is a, it's all of us have been impacted by this global project called white supremacy, and some of us were left behind because our relatives were taken in the transatlantic slave trade and mm-hmm. left behind, and then were colonized. Okay, mm-hmm. after, after being separated from family, then only to be colonized, you know, on our land and treated as second class citizens, you know, and then some of us, you know. Uh, were taken and st- stolen and then forced, you know, into that transatlantic, that heinous transatlantic slave trade where o- over 1 million people died in transit, you know? And then, so I, I just, I want people to remember that the connect, the connectivity, I think there's too much. Um, I think we can forget, <laughs> you know, I think we can forget like, uh, there were multiple sites of harm, yes. you know, the only the, the site of harm, was not only in the U.S. The U.S. chattel slavery. The site of harm, the initial site of harm, was there in West Africa. Mm. And what is now known because this was this is made up, Nigeria. What is now known as Ghana. What is now known as Sierra Leone. What is now known as Senegal. You know what I mean? Like it's yes, so on and yes. on. I think we have to remember that. So that to me is really important to be able to make to bring that forward, um, and to know that. Um, and, and for us to know, but also to, for African Americans that you, to know that they be, that you belong to a people, uh, you belong to a land, you know, and that we belong to one another. That to me is really important. Important. That's my passion. 
Um, and that's why I, I, that's my approach, you know, um, in addition to my robust theological, Christian theological um, mm. position on this issue, that's what I try to bring forward in the conversation, because I think a lot of people um, can easily forget that, you know, because again, we're not taught <laughs> these yeah. things. Well, no, this thing, you got to go learn on your own, right? Mm -hmm. so it took a lot of learning, you know, for, and also oral history and things like that. So there's that. Then I would also invite your audience um, to absolutely listen to Get in the Word with Truth's Table. There's a couple of podcasts, but Get in the Word with Truth's Table is a daily audio Bible podcast that's narrated by myself, Akemini Uwan, and Dr. Christina Edmondson, co-host of Truth's Table podcast, which I will get to in a minute. Um, it's the only place online where you can hear Black women read the Bible, the entire Bible, in a year. Um, we, we read and pray, read and pray on a daily basis. That is what you hear. Um, from us. And so, uh, so yeah, we're excited, you know, uh, and we're grateful, you know, to have been able to put out that ministry resource. And we just want people to listen to that um, and be blessed by it. You know, it's only about it's, each episode is no longer than 20 minutes. Typically people, you can hit it right when you wake up, hit it. And there's a new episode, you know, for you, or if you're just now hearing about it, just look up, get in the world with truth table and you can start your day one whenever you want, or you could jump around. It's up to you. Uh, but we do read, uh, typically it's the old Testament and new Testament reading in each reading. Uh, and then there's also truth table, the original podcast, truth table podcast, uh, which as you said, uh, uh sis Beverly is a, um, award-winning podcast. Praise the Lord, you know, for that. And our book of the same title, truth table, black women's musings on life, love and liberation was nominated for a 2003 NAACP Image Award, and we are very, um, we're godly proud um, of that work and grateful to God for that. Um, and then if you want to follow me, you can follow uh, me on Instagram at Sister Theology. Uh, on Twitter, I don't know how much long I'll be on Twitter because, well, I don't know. Elon's about to start charging us apparently, but at sister, I S T A underscore theology. Mm -hmm. And then my website, if you want me to come and speak, I could, I teach, I, I teach the Bible, you know, I can teach all reparations. I teach on colorism. I teach on all types of subjects that, um, have pertinence to our community, um, from a Christian lens. You can, um, look me up at systematictheology.com and go to the, um, speaker or a book tab and you'll see that s i s t a m a t i c theology.com so i think that's every thing and then you know truth table you can just google truth table and should come up you'll see all the truth table things <laughs> well thank you so much for that and thank you for spending time with us again today it's just been phenomenal as always. And, you know, before we I close out, as we always do, I'm going to ask you, would you please close our program out with prayer and viewers join in this prayer with us? Yes, I'm happy to do it. Oh, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Oh, Lord God. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Thank you, Lord God, for my time here at the well. I'm grateful for my sister, Beverly Allen. Lord, I pray that you will bless her, oh God, exceedingly and abundantly above all she can ask or think. Oh God, for this work, this ministry work that she is doing here, Lord. And I pray you will bless the, the viewers and the listeners who tune in every week um, uh, to her show, oh Lord God. I pray, oh God, that they heard something here that was encouraging, maybe convicting, maybe edifying, oh God. Um, something that drives them to go back to the text, to go revisit Luke 19 and and and, and see uh, Jesus' interaction with Zacchaeus, oh Lord. Um, and I do pray, oh God, that by your, in, in your infinite grace and wisdom uh, and justice, because you are a God of justice, I pray that we as a people would absolutely live to see the day that we see full scale reparations, not only on the federal, but on the global scale, happen and come to us, oh God, um, in response, oh God, to the uh, confession, oh God, of the wickedness uh, that was wrought upon us by the U.S., um, Europe, oh God, Portugal, Spain, so many other actors, oh God, uh, and, and the Catholic Church, oh Lord, as well as the Protestant Church who had a hand in you and in uh, chattel slavery and colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade, Lord, we're trusting and believing, oh God, that you will do this, oh Lord God, if not in our lifetime, uh, in the lifetime of those in the next generation to come, oh God. We look to you, we trust you, oh God, and we Thank cannot you, wait until that day when we're on the other side in glory, worshiping around the 
throne. And when you, oh God, in your infinite wisdom will bring the restoration of all things, oh God, we can't wait and we celebrate and um, thank you in advance, oh Lord God, for calling us to yourself and choosing us to be your children, no longer enemies of the cross, but children, beloved children of God. I pray this all in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much. And viewers, thank you for being with us again this week. We'll look for you next week. Same time, same place. Until then, God bless you. Stay safe and stay, stay well. Bye. <laughs>